How do you determine what you should do, how you should live, what is right, and what is wrong? See, every person lives by some standard of authority. Sometimes the standard is your own self, and sometimes it is somebody else or some group of people. I want you to imagine the following scenario. I want you to imagine that someone very close to you in your family has a terminal medical condition, and you discover that the only treatment available is experimental, and it costs more every month than you could possibly afford. You try to borrow the money, but you can't. Your insurance will never cover the cost, and there's no other option available. The only way to save your loved one is to steal the money. What would you do? And why would you do it? Now certainly, although you'll, you'll never, you'll, you'll not always face those kinds of life and death decisions, your reasoning of why you chose whatever it is that you chose in that given scenario will give you great insight into the authority that you use for your life. The purpose of this series is to learn about Jesus' authority and why we should all live according to his authority and how to live by his authority. The purpose of this lesson is to learn why Jesus has supreme authority, our need for authority, and the importance of living in the name of the Lord Jesus. As we begin, let's think about the fact that Jesus is Lord and King. We have to have this as the foundation as we study things concerning the authority that we are to live our lives by. First, let's briefly try to understand the concept of authority. Someone who is in a position of authority is someone who's in a position to give orders and to judge whatever actions another um, another does, to make and enforce laws, and to determine the proper standard of conduct. Now there are two essential components of having authority, that is power and right. The one with authority has power, has a position of power over another, and has the right to instruct others in the way or ways that those people should live. Whatever standard you use to determine the proper conduct in your life is therefore considered to have both power and right to tell you how to live. Well, as we understand authority then in a very general way, we need to recognize that God has all authority. Of all the various standards people often use in determining right and wrong, God is the only one who has the power and right over everything and everyone. Now, when we're talking about God, let's really understand who we're talking about. The Bible teaches the, um, the doctrine of what we might call the Trinity, or as many have called the Trinity. That is, there are three beings who all possess the nature of being God. That is, the Father, the Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. All three have power and right over us. Look at Matthew chapter 28 verses 19 and 20. This is Jesus's great commission as it's often called before he ascends into heaven. And he tells his disciples, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you, and remember I'm with you always to the end of the age. And they all function in a united way as one God. Though we also recognize that the Father is recognized as the head, even the head of Jesus, according to 1 Corinthians 11 and in verse 3. So, when we understand who God is then, now we need to consider, why does God 
have authority over me? Why does God have authority over you and how you should live? Well, there are many ways we could certainly answer that question, but let's just consider a few basic points. Number one, that God is the creator. Nothing would exist without God. Genesis 1 and verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Therefore, nothing and nobody could possibly have more power and right than God does. You could read Psalm 104 to see how everything depends on God. Well, the next thing I'd like us to consider is that God is eternal, and he's all-powerful, and he's all-knowing, and he's ever-present. These four characteristics separate God from everything and everyone else. Everybody else had a beginning point. Everyone else fails to have complete power. They all have limited power. They all have limited knowledge. And they all have a limited presence. And so all of this emphasizes God's dominion. Isaiah 55 verses 8 and 9, God says that his thoughts aren't our thoughts. And his ways aren't our ways. For as the heaven is higher than the earth, so my ways, God says, are higher than your ways. And my thoughts than your thoughts. One other reason of why we need to recognize that God has the ultimate authority over how we should live is that God calls people to be holy. That God is holy, that is, he's separated from everything that's evil, he's devoted to everything that's good, 1 John 1 and verse 5. In fact, to even go a step further, we need to recognize that what God considers to be holy is the standard that we must use to determine what is right and what is wrong. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verses 15 and 16, it teaches us that as the one who called you is holy, that is God, you also are to be holy in all your conduct, for it is written, be holy because I am holy. So God's holiness then determines our holiness. Next, we must recognize that God is the judge. God is the only one who will be in a position of final judgment over your life and over my life to determine whether what we did was right or wrong, and our eternal destinations will hang in the balance. Therefore, we must fear God and we must keep his commandments, recognizing that we will come before God in judgment and every act about our lives will be brought before him, even those things that we thought were hidden, whether good or evil. So God has all authority. But then we need to recognize that the Bible teaches us that God has given all authority to Jesus. Although the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit should all be honored as God, the Scriptures teach that God the Father has given all authority to Jesus. There in that passage in Matthew 28 that we looked at verses 19 and 20 just a moment ago, Jesus, before he tells his apostles those things, he said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Jesus Christ was sent from the Father, and he sacrificed his life to save us all. Being humbled, because Jesus humbled himself and be, became obedient to the Father to the point of dying on the cross, God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name. Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11. Every knee, the passage says, in heaven, on earth, and under the earth will bow before him. Every knee or every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now certainly some will choose to do this while they live on this earth as Matthew 10 verses 32 and 33 pictures. But some, the rest, 
will bow before him in judgment and their tongues will confess, will praise the name of Jesus on the judgment day. Romans 14 verses 10 through 12. We also must recognize that the name of Jesus is the only name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. Romans or Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. And that God will judge the world by Jesus Christ. And God has given proof of Jesus' authority by raising him from the dead. Acts 17 verses 30 and 31. So when we stand before God on this judgment day, we will be standing before Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. So God has given all authority to Jesus. And so as we appreciate that, we must recognize then that Jesus Christ is king. You think about the idea of king, and many places in this world, right, we don't have the, um, the, the position of king, a uh, monarchy very often. The idea of king, though, is one is the supreme ruler over all the others. So others must submit to the authority of the king. Now, throughout the scriptures, we can see God's promise to send a king. For example, God promised uh, King David that he would establish an everlasting kingdom through his lineage, 2 Samuel 7, verse 16. And the prophets also said um, that there was a coming king, Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7. Well, Jesus Christ is that king. If you notice in Matthew chapter 21, you could read the first five verses um, about Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem on a donkey and how Jesus sent his disciples to, to get this uh, donkey and to, to bring it to him. And this took place, it says in verses 4 and 5, so that what was spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled. Tell daughter Zion, see, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So all of this was related to the prophecy about Jesus as king. Well, Jesus as king over his kingdom is a prominent theme then throughout the New Testament scriptures. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13 says that he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. That is Jesus. And you could also read 1 Timothy 1, verses 16 and 17. In fact, what we find about Jesus is he's not just a king, but he is the king who is far above all other kings. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 20 through 23 says he exercised this power in Christ by raising him from the dead and seating him at his right hand in the heavens, far above every ruler and authority, power and dominion and every title given, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he subjected everything under his feet and appointed him, Jesus, as head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of the one who fills all things in every way. In 1 Timothy 6 and verses 13 through 16, it says, In the presence of God, who gives life to all, and of Christ Jesus, who gave a good confession before Pontius Pilate, I charge you to keep this command without fault or failure until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. God will bring a this about in his own time. He is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal power. Amen. And next, we notice in Revelation 19 verses 15 and 16 picturing Jesus a sharp sword came from his mouth so that he might strike the nations with it he will rule them with an iron rod he will also trample the winepress of the fierce anger of God the Almighty 
and he has a name written on his robe and on his thigh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Jesus as King implies that he has sole authority over our lives. If we desire to be part of Jesus' kingdom and receive the blessings of being citizens of his kingdom, our lives must recognize his complete authority and submit to him in everything. But next, not only is Jesus Christ king, but Jesus Christ is Lord. The idea of a Lord is one who is the master over another. So the servant must submit to the master's authority. Throughout the gospel records, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we read about when Jesus was on this earth that Jesus is declared as being Lord by those who followed him and those who believed in him to be the Son of God. Let's read a few verses here. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 2. There's a man with leprosy who came up and knelt before Jesus saying, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. In verse 25 of the same chapter, on another occasion, here's the disciples woke Jesus up. Lord, save us. We're going to die. You can also read Matthew 15, verse 25. Furthermore, Jesus declared himself to be Lord. You can read about Matthew 12 and verse 8, Jesus declaring himself as Lord of the Sabbath. But Matthew 24, verse 42, says, Therefore be alert, since you don't know what day your Lord is coming. And then this idea of Jesus as Lord and Messiah is the great climax of the sermon that was preached on Pentecost after Jesus ascended to heaven in Acts chapter 2 and verse 36. Where Peter said, therefore, let all the house of Israel know with certainty that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead demonstrated that Jesus really is the Son of God. The apostles and others were witness to the, resurrect to the resurrected Christ and now Jesus had been exalted to the, ex, to the right hand of God. Acts 2, verses 32 through 35, preceding this verse that we just read. So he has been positioned as king. And now he is being declared as Lord. There should be no doubt then that God has given Jesus the position of Lord. And people then must humble themselves before him and submit to him as king and as Lord, as you continue reading in verses 37 through 41. Jesus as Lord implies that he has sole authority over our lives. If we desire to live in Jesus' service and to be found good and faithful servants, then our lives must recognize his supreme authority and submit to him in everything as the one Lord or Master. Of our lives. But now that we've established that Jesus is Lord and King, let's consider our need for authority. We might ask ourselves the question, why can't we just live according to our own authority? Certainly there are many who rebel against authority because they don't want to recognize anyone as having power and right over them over any aspect of their lives even. They just want to do and live in whatever ways they desire. But consider how authority is, is generally recognized in various areas of our lives that we need authority. For example, consider in the government. How well would society function if there was no one who had any authority to make any laws, including any property laws? So I could just come take whatever was yours if I determined that was acceptable. Or any driving automobile uh, laws, operating those. Anyone could um, fly an airplane and anyone could drive a car and any, anyone could drive those things however they wanted to. Or regarding murder, right? it, that, that there would be no authority to 
um, determine whether it was right or wrong to take another's life. Or think about if there was no authority to enforce the laws that were made. Or think about if there were no consequences for breaking those laws. How well would society function? Or think about the workplace. How well would businesses function if everyone could just conduct themselves by whatever standard they determined to be appropriate? Or if there was no accountability for how well someone did or whether someone was doing their job or anything? Or if there was no agreed upon standards of conduct? How well would businesses function? How well would the customers of those businesses appreciate that if there were no standards? Or think about in school. How well would schools function if there were no universal standards of right and wrong? Think about if there was no way you could know what was right and wrong, for example, in math. So if 3 plus 3 could equal whatever you wanted it to equal. Or think about if teachers could teach just whatever they wanted, whatever they felt or whatever they believed, whatever their opinions were. Or think about if students had just as much authority as the teacher, right? How well would all of these things function? Well, then when you think about it in the area of God's ultimate authority, I want you to recognize Jesus set the example of listening to God's authority when he was here on this earth, right? Why can't we just live according to our own um, desires and our own authority? Well, even Jesus didn't when he was on the earth. For example, we read about Jesus being tempted on different occasions, primarily in Matthew chapter 4 and verses 1 through 11. And Jesus could have chosen to just fulfill his own physical desires instead of doing the will of God. But Jesus was devoted during his life that he was going to do the will of God, not live to please his own desires physically. In John chapter 4 and verse 34, Jesus says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And John 5 and verse 30, Jesus says, I can do nothing on my own. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And we can see that put into practice regarding prayer. Matthew 6 and verse 10, as he taught individuals to pray. And Luke 22 and verse 42, we see Jesus implementing it in his life, in his prayers. So let's come back to the idea then of why should we listen to Jesus' authority. Reasonable people recognize that there, there must be authority in these various areas of life that I've just went over. Yet how does that apply to when we think about recognizing Jesus' authority? Well, it goes back to some of the things that we mentioned early on in our study. One thing is that God is the only one who knows all things. Romans 11, verses 33 through 36, praises God, saying, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and of the knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and untraceable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? And who has ever given to God that he should be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things... To him be the glory forever. Amen. So you're limited in your understanding, and you will often fail if you don't listen to God. Well, second, as we mentioned just a moment ago, that God will judge every aspect of how you lived on this earth, determining whether what you have done is good or evil. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. You will not be able to escape God's judgment. So you need to listen to his authority. The next thing we need to recognize and appreciate is that failing to listen to God's authority is called sin. Isaiah, or 1 John chapter 3, and in verse 4, everyone who commits sin practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And then we can look at other passages that talk about how sin results in spiritual death. It results in separation from God, Romans 6 and verse 23, and ultimately then an eternal punishment in hell, Revelation 21 and verse 8. So refusing to accept Jesus' authority results in many consequences, both physically and certainly spiritually. 
for refusing to accept Jesus' authority ultimately is to refuse to accept God's authority. Remember that God has the power and right over us based on those things we talked about earlier in our study. And he has given that power and that right, that authority, he has given it to Jesus, who is both Lord and King. Now, as we think about the need for authority and why listen to Jesus' authority, well, we're taught in scriptures to learn from the past. So we need to learn from past rebellion to God's authority. How did that work out for those who rebelled against God? Romans 15 and verse 4 says, Whatever was written in the past was written for our instruction so that we may have hope through endurance and through the encouragement from the scriptures. You could also read 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6 and verse 11 about the examples particularly of the Israelites in the Old Testament and how we need to learn from them so we don't do the same things and have the same consequences as they had. So we need to learn how it worked out for those who rebelled against God's authority. And we could talk about so many examples of that in the uh, scriptures, but just think about a few with me. Think about Adam and Eve. Right, the first example of people rebelling against God's authority in Genesis 2 and 3. Although God told them, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and he warned them that if they didn't listen, that they would die. But they chose not to listen to God, evidently thinking that it would be worth it. However, they experienced spiritual death for rebelling against God. Pain and suffering began in this world and they were cast out of the Garden of Eden forever separated um, on this earth from the tree of life no longer being able to live forever so how did rebelling against God work out for them next we can read about an example of Na uh, of Nadab and Abihu who were two priests in Leviticus 10 verses 1 through 3 these two priests presented an offering to God that involved unauthorized fire that God had not commanded them. And this resulted in God sending a consuming fire so that they died. How did not accepting God's authority work out for them? Or you can read about an individual named Korah in Numbers chapter 16. And Korah and the others who rebelled with him against God rebelled, they did so by challenging those he had given authority to. And as a result, God caused the earth to open and swallow them all. Again, how did their rebellion against God's authority work out for them? Certainly we could give other examples of that, but you should notice that it never ends well for those who rebel against God's authority. In contrast, we could see examples of how God always takes care of those who are faithful to him in humble service and rewards them at least in the end, at least spiritually. So with these principles established, I want to move on to providing a springboard of sorts to the rest of the series as we are going to be studying about Jesus' authority and knowing what he wants and applying that to our lives and so forth. We must do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Please recognize that citizenship in Jesus' kingdom hinges on submitting to King Jesus. Consider the parable of the net in Matthew chapter 13, verses 47 through 50. It says again, The kingdom of heaven is like a large net thrown into the sea. It collected every kind of fish, and when it was full, they dragged it ashore, sat down, and gathered the good fish into containers, but threw out the worthless ones. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will go out, separate the evil people from the righteous, and throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So only those who do what is good will be rewarded. Those who, will, who do evil will be punished with a great punishment, it shows us here. And good and evil is determined not by what we say, but what, by what the king says. 
See, you see, not just anyone gets to inherit the kingdom of heaven. Only those who submit their lives to King Jesus so as to receive the forgiveness of their sins will inherit his kingdom. In 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11, it says, Don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit God's kingdom? Do not be deceived. No sexually immoral people, idolaters, adulterers, or males who have sex with males, no thieves, greedy people, drunkards, verbally abusive people, or swindlers will inherit God's kingdom. And some of you used to be like this, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So we must be among those who submit to Jesus, not among those who rebel against King Jesus. Because the lawless, lawlessness will be punished. Some people will never recognize Jesus so as to attempt to honor him as king and obey him, and they will be punished. Others confess Jesus as Lord, and they do some good things in the name of Jesus. Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the, only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name, and do many miracles in your name? Then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. So because these did not live their whole lives in the name of the Lord, they are still guilty of lawlessness and they will be eternally separated from Jesus. So clearly it's not enough to just believe in Jesus and to do just some things in the name of the Lord Jesus. Right? That's not the same as fully submitting yourself to Jesus as your King and as your Lord. Instead, everything must be yielded to King Jesus. Colossians 3 and verse 17 describes what God expects. It says, And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whatever you do and whatever you say must be said and done in the name of the Lord Jesus. There are no acceptable exceptions. I want you to notice that King Jesus expects you to do more than just those things you may consider to be part of your religious practices in service to him. While it certainly applies to how you practice your religion, so to speak, it also applies to every word you say, every thought you think, how you treat other people, your characteristics and your habits, your actions, etc. It imply, applies to everything in your life must be laid at the feet of King Jesus, who is Lord of your life. To do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus is to do everything by his authority. You see, to do something in the name of someone else is to do it, that thing in the name of the other person. For example, when an officer tells someone to stop in the name of the law, they are appealing to the authority of whatever jurisdiction, whatever government that he serves. And if you were the executor of an estate carrying out the will of someone else, well, you would do those things that were specified in the will in the name of the person who had passed away, simply by doing whatever the will specified. But doing it in the name of that person, by that person's authority, with that person's approval or permission. So doing everything in the name of the Lord involves far more than just believing in Jesus and calling him Lord and saying that you do things in the name of the Lord. It involves making sure that everything you do, say, and think actually has King Jesus' stamp of approval, so to speak. So you don't just think or hope that King Jesus is pleased with what you're doing. Rather, you act with confidence, knowing that he has given you 
approval, as giving you authority for whatever it is that you're doing. Throughout this series, we're going to be exploring how it is we know whether we have King Jesus' approval for something or not. But let's just understand right now that we must have that approval to please our King. As we close this first lesson, let's recognize that all authority belongs to God and He has given all authority to Jesus Christ. Today, you must recognize Jesus' supreme authority over your life as both King and Lord. And then you must determine that you will honor King Jesus throughout your life by doing everything in His name, as there is no name, no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. Acts 4, verse 12.